Welcome back, everybody. For episode 16, I'm going to carry on where I left off from episode 15, um, where I went through and trimmed all of these frame segments and made sure that they fit, aligned them, did any final tweaking, and got them ready for assembly here on the fixture. Now, if you look behind me, you'll notice that all of these, with the exception of frame K, special case, I'll get into that in another episode, they're all trimmed, fitted, deburred, and ready to go. So they're assembled in the fixture and uh, ready for the next step, which is going to be to fit these splice plates. Um, to, sorry, to fit and manufacture these splice plates. So if you remember back to some of the earlier episodes, I described the construction of the Typhoon, and when dealing with the monocoque specifically, uh, Hawker built it, well, Gloucester, <laughs> built the aircraft in four sections. Um, you'll notice there's four segments for every one of these frames, and it was done that way to maximize production capabilities and maximize the amount of people you could have working on one big assembly at once. So they would have multiple fixtures building the top segment, the side segments, and uh, the bottom segments, and then it would be brought together in a final uh, assembly fixture, and these would all be riveted together and joined with these splice plates. So every frame has four of these, and it's a bit of a challenge to make them. So that's what we're going to do this episode. These fit onto that splice point where we trimmed everything so neatly. They uh, surround the stringer cutout, reinforce that cut out part of the frame and they also reinforce the uh, the inside lip of the frame and will get riveted not only on that lip but also on the uh, the face or the web of each frame so there's again there's four of these uh, the top two are mirror images of each other but not necessarily symmetrical and it's the same thing with the bottom ones with the exception of frame K I've started with the rear seven frames on the Typhoon and uh, what I did initially was Again, just like I did to make the templates in the, um, or, or for trimming the frames, I went back to the form block um, CAD drawings that we have, and I basically spliced the frames together. I got rid of the extra inch, divided on the center frame, or center line of that stringer cutout where the joint is, and um, created a very small template to give me the proper curve of what we're trying to achieve with these form blocks. Now, it's really important to note that the Typhoon's fuselage isn't an actual oval. So when you have this dimension um, or this center line, the curve is not the same on the top as it is on the bottom. So you can't just have a, a true radius throughout. It has to fit exactly in there because if you remember, there's going to be rivets um, that hold between the frame and this flange here. So it has to fit tightly or you're going to end up with all sorts of... Um, puckering and sucking into the material. So, Another issue is that the form blocks themselves um, were designed to uh, be shaped over the inside mold line. So the form block was actually the thickness of the inside of the material thickness uh, on the parts that we were forming. So because this one actually wrap, wraps around that, we're off by a material thickness. And we needed to, to adjust these. I went in and I adjusted them by 40 thousandths of an inch, which is the frame thickness and I offset them so it's basically the outside mold line of the frame because this component is going to wrap around that. So now I wanted to minimize the amount of tooling that I needed because these are small parts. It would be really cool to blast through them, but they're quite tricky and you want them to fit perfectly. So um, basically what I've done is I've created tooling that allows me to mirror these. Uh, both top segments um, are going to be mirrors of each other and that'll keep the curves where they need to be and both bottom segments, again, are going to be mirrors of each other so it'll keep our curves accurate uh, so that means i just need uh, two of that piece of tooling or two special pieces of tooling per frame which isn't too bad considering the alternatives um, but i do need a base jig so i created a aluminum form block and this is just basically the base of the form block and uh, it is set up to produce all the different sizes of these using a series of blocks the one block that'll have to change is this one. And this is the one that I trace the curve from these little templates onto and cut out so that it matches the contour correctly. That's 
the wrong one. <laughs> that looks horrible. Um, this is a JK one. So, so it matches the contour correctly. This will be our form block, and um, I'll be able to do both port starboard splice plates with this one piece of tool, which is great. <laughs> which is great. Um, now, again, I've got to do the same thing. Each frame is going to require a bottom one, so the bottom contour is slightly different. Uh, it might be hard to see on camera, but uh, just slightly different. But it makes all the difference in the world. So I'll make another one of these to do the bottom, and then uh, we'll be done with frame K. The first bend that I do is basically to bend 90 degrees, and it's to bend this bend here, just that vertical leg. And that is, of course, off of this guy. So I use this fixture itself. I've cut a relief. You can see it's uh, a curve here. And I kind of cheated on this because I didn't want to have to cut multiple backing blocks. This is uh, the largest relief. It supports it very nicely, but it'll support all the shapes. I didn't need to go into too much work on that one. Um, but essentially, the piece of material will go in here, and I can now bend over that form block with blows this way. I'll show you in a minute how that works. The second stage of this form block is to move this back into this location. Adds this, which is, I ended up riveting it together to give me the correct thickness because I needed a half inch. This piece just goes up here and it allows me to, uh, again, I'll put this in the vise and it allows me to bend over that second leg, which is this little guy here. Again, what I've done with this is um, it doesn't match perfectly on these rear frames. It's the contour of a forward frame. So it's really crucial that I'm able to shrink that flange because then I can bring it in and uh, tighten it up to match the lower one uh, on every specific one. Again, that's to save tooling or else I'd be making so many different parts for this thing it would get ridiculous. So it already is kind of ridiculous. But I've proven this. It works. Um, I'm able to, with uh, the correct amount of extra material on the blank, I shrink it, and I actually use my aggressive shrinking jaws that destroy the material, but again, I'll show you that later. And the third part, once this is all done, is this piece here. Now, this one is designed for the smallest frames, and it's designed to sit in here. You'll notice that I've got a radius on the back of it, and that's because it's got to sit inside nicely here. So. The distance here is crucial between the hole center and that guy there. So everything is centered. I've got scribe center lines. They might not show up on video. Um, but essentially that's nice and tight in there. And then I form this last bend, which is the, uh, the stiffener that goes around the stringer hole. So because there's three different web thicknesses on these the frames that I'm working on here I've cut out this notch to fit the small guys and it's a known dimension that increases on each web so I've got uh, for example the next size up is one quarter inch bigger web so I've got this little guy and it's a one quarter inch stick that I just put a nice radius on so again it'll sit into the radius on that piece so I get a true measurement this guy will sit in here and uh, hold it one quarter inch away, so I have one quarter inch larger web. There's also a half, and uh, one I've got here is a, a three quarter for the larger frames. Exact same situation. It's got a, uh, a radius on it. It sits into there, I'll push my blank in, and I can hammer that down, and it gives me the true dimension that I need for that, uh, that web. So, without further ado, let's get some blanks cut, and I'll, uh, I'll take you through building one of these bad boys. Line up the uh, center line with the center line of the fixture, and then uh, tighten her up. So again, guys, you'll notice some of my favorite tools, my homely hammer, uh, just to get things going here. It's a 
enough for me. And then uh, my rivet set. Now again, we're looking at a um, bend here that's going to require shrink, so it's absolutely crucial that I start knocking this metal down to try and create a ruffle and work it back on itself so there's minimum shrinkage required after I do this process. To do that, I work in from both ends, and you can see it's going to pucker up. And you just work it back on itself like that. So remember I said that this block here, uh, form block for our second bend, is not the correct radius, it's just the generic one that I used. And here you can see that because it doesn't have quite the same contour as this, which is the form block for that particular frame segment. You can see there's a gap in there and that's not cool because when the rivets are driven through this way, if that doesn't match the frame, again, it's going to pucker, and I need to take care of that. Now, if I shrink it, I can bring it in tighter and knock it back down, and it'll fit that correctly. So basically, saving a lot of tooling, but having to add a little bit of manual work to uh, correct the, the profile that forms with that block. Uh, now it's time for this other member here, and I'm just going to put it on quickly and temporarily. Um, if you recall, I've got this cut out so that curve will sit in there nicely. Line up my center line. Basically, we're forming this curve here, which forms very nicely on the aluminum. Um, but to do that, we need to relieve here. So uh, what I'll do is I'll take this over to the punch and I'll, I'll knock it out and then clean up that radius. Looks pretty good. Um, <laughs> lots of extra material here. So we're getting closer to its final form, uh, but now is the time to start having a quick look at it. Start with the template. See that everything's maintaining its shape there. Looks pretty darn good. It fits really nicely, but uh, it doesn't sit square. So our contour is correct. This shape is correct, but it, uh, it's not 90 degrees here. So I've got to push this back a little bit. And I think before I do that, I am going to uh, give this a little bit of a trim and then check it again to make sure the contour doesn't change. So it looks like it might have changed it a little bit, but it could also just be that it's not square. So the first thing I'm going to do now is uh, square this back up.
Now you want to be careful. I don't know if you could see what I was doing there, but I wasn't striking this metal faced hammer with the material in between directly against this uh, bar that I have here. Again, polished with a nice radius on it so it doesn't damage in here. If you do that, you're more than likely gonna stretch the area that you've just shrunk. So um, ideally what you wanna do, I was bringing this angle back as well as dropping the other one back to 90. So I was hitting just away, basically, so I was hitting here when the metal was in contact here and that brought it back to the angle that I wanted. So without stretching it. Very close to the contour, a little bit extra shrink in there, which is good because I still need to trim this one here. One thing that people don't understand about the Typhoon's construction is that the stringers, these guys, don't actually connect to the frames. They're only connected to the skin, with the exception of uh, frame K. There's two rivets that hold the end, and up at the back side of frame A, same thing. Um, but they're not attached to any of these ribs or uh, frames in between. So what I'm looking for is that when it's riveted to the skin, it can move side to side and has a little bit of clearance in there, as well as up and down because I don't want this uh, new splice plate to be putting pressure on the stringer and I don't want the stringer to be stuck and putting pressure on either frame side. Doubler plates are in position. You can see in here it reinforces the area around that stringer cutout. The stringer is going to pass through there. Again there's going to be rivets. I believe there's five rivets that are placed in this area on both sides of that splice and then there's rivets also placed on this, um, I guess it would be in this channel here, so it would be riveting this way. All right, so there you have it. That's the process that I uh, deduced to uh, build these little guys. There's barely any material in them. They just use the scraps left over from the production of the frames, um, but they're very finicky and they've got to fit just right or we're going to end up with a lot of deformation on structural parts, which is not good. So. Um, We've got one down, there's 40 more of that type to go, and then frame A after that. I'm going to get to work on these guys, I've got to make more of the uh, individual form blocks for these, uh, the way I showed you, and um, yeah, I'll be busy for a little while on that. Again, these are O material, and uh, very happy to say that uh, Pyrotech Aerospace has agreed, and eagerly agreed, to become our new sponsor. Uh, so we'll get these over to Pyrotech for solution heat treatment. In the same batch, I'm going to tuck a couple other parts from another assembly that we've been working on but haven't talked about for a while, and we'll get them all heat treated together, uh, but I'll save that for another episode. Thank you guys so much for following along. Stay tuned for uh, the next steps of the process of the Airworthy Rebuild of Hawker Typhoon JP843.